So I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes. Um, uh, we're not using amplification tonight, so uh, I'm going to try to talk loud enough, and I think that I can, but um, you know, we may need to keep it uh, down a little bit in here just so that we can hear. Um, so if you've enjoyed yourself this weekend and are kind of thinking, I'd like to hear more of this or do more of this, well, that's kind of what Augusta College is all about. So we intend to doing lots more. In fact, the whole year-long version of it. Uh, Dr. Patrick is preaching tomorrow morning uh, at the River Church, which is meeting in the next building over at 9.15, is that right? Um, yeah, and then at 1.30 in the afternoon at Diana Jasmine's farm down in Ellet Valley, six minutes that way, uh, we're going to have just kind of a tea in the afternoon. It's informal, and it's really just kind of talking about, well, what can we do to continue to move pieces forward to get Augustine College launched in the NRV in 2018. So anybody who wants to is welcome to come to that. Um, I'm just going to talk for a couple of minutes here um, just to kind of give you a little bit of the history of trying to put this together here and kind of update you guys on where we're at now. And then to, to tell you kind of some needs, um, so like maybe you'll hear something like, oh, I, I could do that or I could be part of that team or whatever. So uh, I met John Patrick for the first time in 20, no, uh, 2004, I think. Um, after the shootings happened in 2007, he came and spent a week with us on campus, uh, and some great things came out of that week. During that week, he said to me and to a few others during that week, this would be a great place to do a second Augustine College. Um, that was 10 years ago. I thought, wow, that's a great idea. That'd be really fun. Probably never get the bandwidth to actually make that happen. Um, but he's continued to come back every couple of years or so and has continued to say that. And at uh, some point about 18 months ago, I guess he kind of said it to enough people and we managed to talk to each other enough and the Holy Spirit kind of brought us together that it kind of started happening, which is really exciting. So um, what's happening now? So we did this. And the idea of this is really to kind of show you what Augustine College is more than just talk about it all the time. So hopefully that's been somewhat helpful. It really, I'm feeling really excited. It feels like this has really built a lot of momentum. A lot of people are interested. Uh, some kind of key things that we have to have in place to be able to launch this thing 10 months from now is uh, we need a small group of students. I'd love to get at least eight to get going the first year. Uh, a lot of the interest this weekend makes it feel to me like we could do that. Could do that. Uh, and then we need faculty. You know, there's roughly 200 lectures that happen over the uh, year-long, eight-month-long course, and we need uh, a person to do each of those 200 things. We don't really want 200 people to each do one, but, uh, you know, 20 people or something like that to each do 10 or 40 people or whatever, but something like that. Those people are starting to come together. And if you've been sitting here this weekend and thought, you know, I have this friend who I, they would love to hear about this. Go tell them about it, because we're still really very much trying to recruit uh, professors who would say, yeah, I'll teach five lectures in the year, and I can teach on fill in the blank. Uh, we believe that the Lord will bring us the people that we need to pull the thing off. Um, so those are kind of two big needs, but I'm really feeling like those things are coming together. Um, we have kind of an acting board. So there's a small group of us that has uh, formed a board, incorporated. We're getting 501c3 tax status, and that small acting board is impermanent and is meant to uh, recruit and kind of build a more permanent board, board of directors. Uh, and that's divided into seven teams, and each of those seven teams are kind of getting established now, and I'm going to name them for you because you might hear one of those every year and go, I could be on that team. I could see how I could fit in there. Um, and those seven teams are going to kind of make up the board of directors. Uh, so those seven teams, which kind of have seven uh, distinct jobs, are uh, there's a governance team. There is a uh, facilities and infrastructure team. There is a recruiting, admissions, uh, and marketing team. There's a professorship team, which is who teaches. And there's an academics team, which is what we teach. Uh, there's a business and finance team. That's one lumped together. Uh, and there's a spiritual direction team. I think that's all seven of them. So if any of those things grabs you and you think, ah, oh, that's kind of my thing, I like that, uh, come talk to me or Yvonne or Gerald or Mark or anybody that you think might know something. You'll eventually get to somebody. Um, so, and, and pray for us. Pray that we'll find the people to do all those things that I've just named. It really feels to me like 
this is building real momentum. Like it's going to happen, and that's super exciting. I would love if I could, you know, pour the next ten or twenty years of my life into this. Uh, I just I think it's really worth doing. Um, so that's kind of where we're at now. Do you guys have any questions that I can answer for you about kind of where things are at right now? What are we trying? You know, anything? Yeah. Uh, could you just outline of the 200 lectures, do they fall under 10 categories? Well, so there's, uh, it depends on how you count it. There's six or eight courses. So there's history of Christian thought. And there's no history class and there's no uh, theology class because really those are in all of them. So history of Christian thought, uh, philosophy, uh, science and faith, art. Uh, there's a seminar on the confessions. There's a seminar on music, Latin or Greek, whatever we can find somebody to do. Have I missed any? Literature. Literature. How could I forget that one? It's like my favorite one. I think that's all of them. Logic and grammar, maybe? Yeah. Trivium. Yes, the semester of the trivium. Yeah. Especially logic. Does that answer your question? Yes. And most of those things you do one lecture a week, and it's two and a half hours or something like that, and it's meant to be, uh, there's a presentation for 45 minutes or so, and then a, a guided discussion, so kind of a Socratic discussion uh, on that topic. And Jack, the, uh, the course um, Christian Thought covers really church history and theology at the same time. Theology in a historical context. <coughs> Is there a location for that? Not for certain. Um, we're praying through that. I'm, I actually feel confident the Lord is going to help us figure that out, but we have not said, oh, it's definitely going to meet in place X. Community is going to be a big part of it. I'm hoping that basically what ends up happening is we have a men's house and a women's house, and folks kind of live in community in those two places, uh, and then we have you know, frequent meals together. Community is a really big, important part of the whole idea. Uh, sort of like in the monastic movement, you know, you just kind of do life together. That's why throughout this weekend we've tried really hard to eat lots of meals together, sit around and talk together. Like, that's, that's part of it. Tuition's going to be $8,500 a year. Somebody must be wondering that. That's the same price as the Ottawa School on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> My bike before I raise my hand. Sorry. Um, would there be? Um, can we think about the opportunity to have um, students in the university somehow interface or attend at some level? We want to figure that out. We haven't kind of gotten to that level of detail at, at, at this point, and, and partly it's like we got to get this thing up and flying before that's even a question. Um, but we don't see any reason where we're going to be like, you know, we might come across somebody who's like, man, I would just love to do the art seminar that you're doing. And we're not going to say, well, no, you can't do it. Like, you have to do the whole thing or you can't come at all. We have to figure that piece out, but we're certainly open to that. Uh, another thing that we're, o that we're up to, and this is just kind of an idea at this point, but I've, I've just really started taking seriously talking about it this way in the last week, partly because it really feels like this thing's starting to get off the ground, is I think much of what we should be doing is we in the NRV should be proving that uh, what's happening at Augustine College in Ottawa can be copied. And we figure out how to copy it. And, you know, not that we make a blueprint that we can just hand to somebody else and say, well, just do exactly this, and it'll, you know, that's kind of a reductionist way of doing it. But um, proving that it can be copied so that we can help others, others do it in other communities. So this doesn't need to just be number two. This can be uh, kind of the vehicle that helps us have numbers three, four, five, six, and seven, and wherever God decides to plant those things. But that's kind of a fun role to have. Any other questions? John's going to just come up and kind of just talk more about Augustine College and just kind of what it is and what it does and how he hopes um, this develops and so on. So any other questions for me about where we're at? Or needs, yeah? In the past you mentioned like these one or two way like compressed versions of Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. Um, so, yeah, if you want to do more of this, in Ottawa, uh, there's a compressed version. Every summer, it's usually the first week in June. This coming year in 2018, it starts June 3rd, I think, within a day or two or whatever. It's the first week, first full week of June. 
And we're basically planning on kind of a contingent of us from here to go up there and do that. We think that's going to lend uh, momentum to getting it going here. So I'm hoping six or even ten of us go up there and do that um, for that first week in June next year. And eventually I hope we're doing a similar kind of thing here. And we'll do that in a way that doesn't compete with theirs. You know, we'll do it at a different time of year or something. So is it structured similar where you would pick out certain lectures for a semester, or is it your year? The idea is you do the whole thing as a package. I mean, kind of the main thing about it, it is an integrated thing. So what you're learning in philosophy goes with what you're learning in art, goes with what you're learning in history of the church, etc. Does that make sense? It does. That's, what I mean, that's actually what's kind of fun about it, yeah. I think. You know, I... You know, I spent a ton of time in school, and I kind of got out, and I, just, I felt totally dissatisfied, because I, I could tell there was this whole big picture thing that nobody had ever bothered to describe to me, and it annoyed me, so I felt so happy to discover Augustan College, where some like smart people were talking about this and actually putting all the pieces together, and of course, a much better way to do it is not the way that I learned it, is I went and learned all these particulars, and then somebody gave me a big picture later, it'd be better to get a big picture at the beginning, which is why this is kind of a gap year thing, and then you go into university, you kind of have a framework to hang all this stuff in. And that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Um, could you also, it's, we need to also say or, or share that it's not, it's not for someone who's totally intellectual or, or writes perfectly. Um, it's anyone who's willing to work hard right. and can write absolutely write a sentence. Um, but some people have ended up becoming a tradesperson afterwards, and some people become department heads somewhere. Right. So this isn't like. I have a friend who, I go to the summer thing most summers, and my friend jokingly calls it nerd camp. Um, and that's kind of true, um, but we're intentionally aiming at, this is not for, like, it doesn't have to be for, like, super high-performing people. Like, basically, if you're an average student and you're willing to work hard, we want that to fit you. Uh, and it doesn't mean, you know, you've got to go on and get an advanced degree. You may even just go, you know, this is, I've learned how to learn, I've got a great framework here, and I'm going to go start a coffee shop, or I'm going to go do whatever. Uh, and I know how to kind of continue my own education here. So we're not all about, oh, this is how you get the highest degree possible. Yes, Ralph? Is this supposed to be for people that have high school or some college or combination or anybody? It, really kind of any of the above. Uh, I would say in Ottawa, what do you think, John, 70% of your students are between high school and college? Something like that? Yeah, some people that older. Would yeah, uh, but, you know, they, they, get, they get people who already have a Ph.D. and kind of anything in between. Really, anybody who wants an integrated... Uh, understanding of the Christian story and all that the church has done. So you uh, start at, after high school, is that right? Kind of, yeah. Like, I think we'd be willing to take a 17-year-old who wanted to do it as their uh, last year of high school. Uh, we might have to figure out a different kind of a living arrangement for them because housing uh, a minor is different than housing an adult. Uh, so that would be probably be kind of the youngest person that we would end up taking. I think we're mostly going to get people that are kind of in the 18 to 24 Category, but really, anybody can come. You can come do it. <laughs> yeah. How is this going to be uh, funded? Is is tuition? Is all the funding going to come from tuition, or will there be other sources? Uh, well, we are going to have a five hundred one c three tax status, uh, so we are going to have donations. Uh, our business team at least has a preliminary goal of raising fifty thousand dollars by June first. So we have some operating money to get through the first year, and I'd really love it if we had $100,000 by day one of school uh, 10 months from now. And then I know that we can get through. The idea is to base, build it basically sustainable uh, on its own tuition. I think we can more or less break even at $8,500 tuition. Uh, we don't make any money on the housing. That, it, that's just passed on to the students. Um, and, and, and that $8,500 is we have you know, 12 or 15 students or something like that. Um, but it, it'll work a whole lot better if we start in the black. Like we've got some money to begin with so that we don't go from zero right back to zero, but we start at 50 and then at the end of the year we're back at 50 again. Does that make sense? It's just a really rough idea of the... So I do want to raise some money, um, but I want as a general philosophy that the tuition more or less sustains it. Other sources of possible income. We can, you know, like, we can do this kind of thing. This could make a little money. I mean, this was a lot of work. I don't think, uh, and you guys didn't have to pay a whole lot for it. Um, at least I didn't think it was a lot of money for what you've gotten. Uh, so, like, this was a lot of work for, how, for the few thousand dollars or whatever that it generated. Um, 
but you can do events that can make some money. Uh, so tuition, donations, and uh, events or seminars are basically, I think, the places for positive inputs for cash flow. But I think it's going to be mostly tuition. I would love it if we can get to the place where we can make tuition cheaper than that. Uh, I don't really see it ever being in a place that is like free. Uh, I think people should pay something. I mean, there are going to be some students that it makes sense. Like, yeah, let's make it free for them. I, I get it. Like that for that person. But uh, I would like it so we could get it cheaper than the eighty-five hundred. But that's a way down the road goal. Probably first, I'd like to be able to pay people better that are helping. So I want to be able to pay something to the people who are doing. Uh, Lectures. I want to pay something to people who are bearing the administrative load and so on. Tommy, suppose the demand is a lot greater than you anticipate. <laughs> That'd be a great problem to have. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Every church family going. Man, I'd be thrilled. Uh, I would. I would send some to Ottawa. And, and again, our whole thing is we want to make sure that everything that we do does not hurt what's happening in Ottawa at all. We think that things really will be synergistic. Um, so, you know, say we ended up in a place where we had 40 people who wanted to do it, were willing to pay, were, you know, we have accepted them, whatever. I would say, all right, let's figure out how to do it with, I'm just making this up, but I would say, let's figure out how to do it with 30 and let's see if we can talk 10 of them into going to Ottawa. I hope that happens. <coughs> Every university town in the country. Yeah, that's what would be awesome. I mean, this is the way that we could actually uh, change the landscape, you know? I mean, just imagine a future 20 years from now where there's 100 of these. That's a real, I think it's exciting to think about. Like, think of the Christian leaders that will come out of that. What was your starting point then? What was your starting point in Ottawa? Well, that'll come to the next question. <laughs> yeah. Any last questions for me? And we'll um, just some of the model that you're presenting sounds something like the Torchbearers uh, Ministry, Cape and Ray, and Major Ian Thomas. Is there any cross pollinization there, or are you aware of that program? I'm actually not aware of them specifically. We have been kind of looking and reaching out to a few uh, different similar kinds of things. There is a, there is an essential difference. Okay. okay. So I don't, know, I don't know the answer to that specific one. Uh, there are a few other groups that are doing somewhat similar things. We are having discussions with them. And in general, it's very positive. Most of them are saying, we don't, you know, there's not enough of this kind of thing happening that we see you in any way in competition with us. You know, they're like, we're affecting a few hundred people, and there's 300 million people on the continent. Um, so it's not like there's this big competition for it. Um, but we do want to... We haven't done a lot of that yet, and I think we'll do more of it as this thing kind of starts to get off the ground. But we do want to network more and cooperate more. Uh, and hopefully we'll have kind of our own distinctive that makes this something special. Um, we'll see. Any other questions? This is kind of fun. <laughs> yes? This, you might have talked about this earlier, and I dismissed it. But is there a reason you picked, like, 20, fall 2018 to start? Um... Fall 2017 yeah. was already done. Yeah. Because <laughs> fall 2017 seemed way too soon. Though, you know, that we, then we only had three months to get going. Um, because why not? Why not try to get it launched? You know, and if we, I hope this doesn't happen. It's conceivable that uh, in the middle of next year, you know, we're three months, two months from a hoped for start date and we've got four students. You know, and then we might go, oh, I don't know, man. I don't know if this is going to happen. I think in that situation, we would work really hard to try to get it up to six or eight. Uh, but it's conceivable we'll just have to, at some point, you know, nine months from now, say, huh, well, we didn't hit our goal, we're going to have to make it 2019. I hope that doesn't happen. It doesn't feel to me like that's going to happen, but we'll see. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What kind of concerns are you hearing about accreditation and transfer and whether or not... So there's no promises uh, from us of credits at this point. Uh, it is a goal. Um, again, we haven't gotten really far down that road. Get, uh, uh, the first thing has been, let's get this thing up and flying first. Um, I personally would be happy to see it grow into a two-year thing, and then it make, that makes it easier to go for accreditation. I think the way to probably get accreditation is going to be through cooperation with some other already existing educational institution. 
And hopefully God will just bring us the right partnership for that. Or maybe it'll be, you know, we'll kind of have a memorandum of understanding with half a dozen or 50 different schools. It'll say, yeah, we'll give you a year's credit for it. I don't know exactly how that's all going to play out. We understand that people would like to be able to get credit uh, for their money and their year's investment. Um, At the end of the day, at least I personally am very much of the thinking of uh, that's not the ultimate goal of education. It's nice to get that value, but I want to keep... Uh, <laughs> thinking well and understanding who we are as the primary goal and accreditation be a really nice, not just a nice thing to get, uh, an important thing to pursue, uh, but not the primary thing. Hopefully I don't get in trouble later for saying that. Anything else? Yes. Yes. Have I forgotten anything? Any of you guys out there thinking, no, you forgot to talk about X, Y, or Z? Thanks a ton to you guys for for being here, for doing this weekend with us. This has been really fun. Um, Love to see you at the river tomorrow morning. Uh, Welcome to the tea tomorrow afternoon. I just thought, I wondered if potential families would be interested in some kind of a discussion string, you know, to find out what's going on, the progress, and the the kinds of questions that might come up rather than just let it go. In other words, uh, keep the discussion going in some way or form for the families in particular, for their their, uh, high schoolers. That's a good thought. Um, We'll have to remember to pick that up, see if we can figure out how to find out if people want to do that and then figure out a way to to do it if people want to do it. Mm But thanks for that thought. That's a good idea. Potentially connected with the graduates. Yeah. Makes mm-hmm. good sense. Is there any kind of connecting the Bradley Center at all? Or yeah. What's going on at the Bradley Center? Yeah, so we've been meeting with Mike Weaver, and we and and he, and hopefully his board as well. We haven't talked to the board as much at this point. I'm really hoping to basically work together. Uh, there's actually not a whole lot of competition between the two of us, but really it's a lot more synergistic. Um, we see them as a great place for us to kind of recruit professors to help make this happen. Hopefully they see us as a place to place professors who want to, you know, be doing something with their faith. So I, I think it's just kind of a, it's providence really, I think, that, that uh, they're kind of getting going the same time we are. All right, well, hopefully John Patrick is more interesting than I've been for the last 10 minutes. (laughs) And feel free to just stop John and ask him questions uh, so that you kind of know more about what Augusta College is. So you guys weren't afraid to ask me questions. Ask him questions. It's nice to talk to you again. I, I think you've probably had enough of me for one day, but uh, I want to start with, with a, a point that was made on road. I want to ask you, as usual, a question. Now, those who ha- are paying the bills for education, what do you normally think your children should be getting out of education? What's the first criterion you think about? Oh, be honest. I love to learn it. That's nice. Love to learn, he said here. But that's an unusual thing that they have for, is it? Feed their family. What? The ability to feed their family. That's right. They want income. Yeah. Uh, In other words, they want relevance to be the primary criterion of learning. That is a deeply non-Christian way of thinking about it. The easiest way to make that point is uh, a famous anecdote about, uh, uh, oh gosh, it's that time of day, the name is gone for the moment, it will come back in a minute, but the quantum physics um, revolution of the 20th century was probably the greatest uh, uh, intellectual revolution of the 20th century, but basically taking part in, taking place in Europe and in, uh, in Manchester and Cambridge. And uh, one of the key players, and you'll tell me who it is, whose name I can't remember, was the, the Danish guy. 
Somebody tell me who it was. Neil Bohr? Sorry? Bohr? Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr, that's right, thank you. Um, just wouldn't come at the moment. Well, Niels Bohr was actually thinking about these things in the 1920s. At that point, the atom was thought of as the ultimate particle. And he came into either Manchester or a Cambridge common room at the end of the day. And as he came in, one of the professors of English saw him and said, Niels, you look as though you've had a, a good day. He said, I had a wonderful afternoon. And he said, well, let me buy you a drink, sit down and tell me what you've done. So he sat down and he said, well, this afternoon I convinced myself that the atom is not the ultimate particle. It can be split into smaller particles. And the prof from the English department said, and what, pray, is the relevance of that? <laughs> <laughs> and Niels Bohr thought for a moment, and then thought, fortunately, he said, none whatsoever, as far as I can see. <laughs> How wrong can you be? In other words, relevance is limiting learning to your rather measly imagination. If you hand over your learning to God, then you will go in very, very different directions. Uh, he promises a safe arrival, he doesn't promise an easy journey, but it will not be boring. Uh, certainly that's been our experience with uh, Augustine College, and as a family it's been our experience as well. Um, and I think as Christians we need to trust God's imagination a little bit more than we do. Um, and so I want to encourage you that, that that these things didn't happen in the Acts of the Apostles and not happen now. They still do. Even people speaking in tongues which other people understand still happens today in Africa. Uh, 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 Gene Rudd, who's the deputy uh, second in command, or was until a few weeks ago, of uh, CMDA, was in Kigali um, at the beginning of the Rwanda War. And he was the only surgeon in Kigali at one point. And he was working very hard. He had a translator uh, with going around because Jean didn't even speak French, let alone Kenya Rwandan. And they'd been working very hard all day, and they were both very tired. And he said to his translator, go to bed and have a sleep. I need to sleep. I'd, I'm dangerous if I did any more surgery. Uh, he said, I just want to go and see one guy, and then I'm going to sleep, and I'll wake you up when I wake up. So off the translator went, and Gene went back to see one man who he thought might not make it, and when he got there, he was sure he was not going to make it. And he realized he hadn't explained the gospel to him at all. And he said, I felt such a fool, but the Lord spoke to me and said, tell him in English. So he told the gospel story to this man with his wife and daughter sitting by his bed in English knowing that they didn't speak English. He said, I felt very stupid, but I did, and then I went and had a sleep. When he woke up, he said to his translator, I want to go back to that family. I imagine the man's dead, but I, I, I want to apologize to the, the wife and the, the, the daughter for what I did, because it really was a bit stupid. So he got there, and he, 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 the man had died. And he, he said to with the translator, I, I, I'm sorry that I, I chatted away in English. It was a silly thing to do, really. And they looked at him and said, but you didn't. You spoke in Kenya Rwanda. And he understood, and he accepted Jesus. That was in 1995, 94. It still happens. But of course, those kinds of things only happen when you are beyond your comfort zone. If you never go beyond your comfort zone, they won't happen. And one of the things that this program has taught us is that it's, it's good. That's, you're not, obviously, to test the Lord, that's very clear, but you are to trust him. Uh, and we've, we've had good reason to see that there is so throughout our lives. Uh, Sally and I and my son, uh, just before the Rwanda War occurred in, in 1994, uh, we had a breakdown, and so we were on the road at one o'clock in the morning, which you shouldn't do in Zaire, uh, a very dangerous country in many ways. On the road we were on, uh, two boys had been shot the week before because they wouldn't give their goat to a soldier. And he said, I'm taking it. He shot them as well. Nothing happened to the soldiers. And we were held up by a drunken soldier with a Kalashnikov at about one o'clock in the morning. 
uh, he got us out of the vehicle, and it was my wife, myself, my son, and three Africans. And my son was standing next to me, and I said after about two minutes, are you frightened? And he said, I'm not, isn't that strange? I said, it is, neither am I, and neither is your mother. And he knows that, and it's really worrying him. <laughs> and then out of nowhere, a senior officer in Mobutu's army appeared out of nowhere, and we were free. I said, what on earth was that all about? Because what we didn't know is that Sally and I were uh, going to be out of contact for six months at a time over the next two years because there was no email, there was no direct contact with that part of Africa and she was running several refugee camps. And the truth of the matter is that neither of us were afraid or worried about the other person at any time. No courage was actually involved because courage is overcoming fear. But we didn't have any. Which is amazing. I mean, we did care about one another. <laughs> uh, on one occasion she called me and I said, where are you? And she said, I'm in Kigali. I said, there's a war going on between where you were and Kigali. She said, it quietened down, so I drove through. <laughs> um, not surprisingly, the missionaries wanted to give her a t-shirt with no fear on it. But, uh, <laughs> that's, these things happen. But they only happen when you're in that kind of environment. And the college has been like that. By the time Sally came back and, uh, and uh, I had begun the career that I've had now, and she immediately took charge saying, you can't do everything you're doing, something will go pop and it'll all be over. Um, and so we, we didn't pray very much because we don't pray a lot, unfortunately. Um, but we said to the Lord we needed some guidance. And, all my friends said, well, there are lots of biochemists and lots of pediatricians, but very few people who can make things accessible in the way that you do. It's obviously a talent you should use. And David and, and Jean at CMDA certainly felt that way. And so by the time Sally came back from Africa, I was doing 100 talks a year. Uh, it went up to about four or 500 at peak. I'm getting old now, so it's come down to about 200 at this stage. Um, that was an, another of these interesting experiences because God right at the beginning made it very clear that this was something that he was in charge of and we weren't. So I took early retirement and our incompetent university administration didn't even get my rather measly pension online to, to start the moment I said I would leave. It was going to be three months late. They apologised, but that's how incompetent they were. So uh, for three months during the summer, I was going to have to use a line of credit, but that didn't really bother me. Uh, uh, sure, I got one. Uh, that wasn't going to be difficult. The last um, t speaking trip I did just before I left was in the States, and it was down the, the West Coast from Northern California down, ending up in uh, Orange County on a Saturday night. And I spoke to about 50 people, a fairly standard sort of talk on Saturday night, mainly doctors, and we spent the night. Mike McLaughlin, who was my driver and guide, um, at a doctor's home in, in uh, Orange County. And the next morning, Sunday, we were flying out around midday from John, John Wayne Airport, and we said to the, the doctor we were staying with, is there a church near the airport? And he said, yeah, my church. And... Uh, he said, it's an early service too. Now you'll, have, you'll easily get to John Wayne without any problem. So he went to his church. Uh, you know, classic evangelical community church. Uh, least said about the music, the better from my point of view, but that's uh, just my hang-up. Um, but uh, they, they read the scriptures well, they prayed well, and then uh, the pastor came to preach. And he got to the the lectern and he said you know as a, a pastor every now and again sorry I'm too soft that's a problem uh, is that better if I face you then somebody else over here can get my attention if necessary uh, the pastor said as a pastor you have to do things that you don't want to do every now and again and one of the members of this congregation bullied me last night into going to a lecture which is not my ideal use of a Saturday evening 
And, uh, and he said, but on the way home, I, I was kicking myself. And I said to my wife, I actually enjoyed that talk. And I, I didn't even ask the guy whether he, he would be available to speak in our church this morning. And he might have been. There were about 500 people there. And he looked straight at me. <laughs> and there was a sort of double take. And he said, Dr. Patrick. And the American woman next to me pushed her church chair back and said, looks as though you're going to be working this morning. <laughs> um, and he said, come up. I thought he'd just introduced me, but he didn't. He took the microphone off and pinned it on me and said, talk to this congregation like you talked to us last night. I know you can do it. You don't need anything, any preparation. So I did. And after about 40 minutes or so, Mike said, time to go to the airport. And uh, Gary, who I got to know, the pastor, said, it's okay, you'll be fine. But he said to the congregation, this guy is a professor who's just given up a regular professor's income to do what he's doing now with no guaranteed income. The Lord has used us to bless him, has used him to, to bless us this morning, so let's bless him. So I'll pray a, a rather longer than usual final prayer to end the service, and you pass the plates quickly. So they passed plates while Gary prayed. They stuffed it all in an envelope, gave it to Mike, and we caught our planes, he going to Oregon and me back to Ottawa. Uh, the only thing on during the summer season was I was going to Taiwan for uh, 10 days to, to teach, and that was all paid for, but no income. Just before I left, I got a check for $6,000 from that collection, which was exactly the amount I needed to get through to September. Uh, I, I didn't use my line of credit. And that sort of thing has happened every now and again. And I know if I get a big check, oh, I've got a bill coming. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is extraordinary. It's a lovely way to be paid, actually. I mean, it's much more fun than opening an envelope or looking at something on your computer. Uh, the next one of that variety, actually, was the first time our daughter from Malawi came home on furlough. And we hadn't thought about what that meant because she used our farm as her base. And both her and David are very people-orientated and have huge networks. And what we didn't realize is how much that was going to cost. And just before she arrived, I was in Denver, and there was a guy there who likes what I do. And he couldn't get to the talks, but he saw I wasn't going out until Monday morning. He sent me an email. He said, I'm sorry I can't get to your talks, but I'd like to take you to breakfast before you go to the airport. Um, I said, fine. And he turned up in a Jaguar E-Type. He said, I thought as a Brit you'd like that. Uh, I hadn't been in one of those for a long while. And we had breakfast, and as I went off to the airport on the bus, uh, he gave me an envelope, and he said, I don't think you appreciate how important what you're doing is. Uh, this is to encourage you. And I said, thank you, and put it in my pocket, obviously. Uh, and I forgot about it till I was halfway home, home and I thought, oh. Uh, I wonder what he's given me, and you know, I thought yeah, a couple of hundred bucks would be nice. But when I opened it, it was six thousand. Uh, I gave it to Sally and said, "What do we do?" And she said, "This is too much. We can't take that much." And I said, "It's a check that's written out to me, and he has a Jaguar E-Type, so he's not actually poor." <laughs> uh, and we put it in the bank. And then Joanna arrived, and Sally find, found herself feeding. 30 people a day for two months. That's quite an expensive thing. In fact, by the time we'd done that and bought a few other things they needed, we were back to square one. Uh, the college has been like that too. Uh, I mean, we started off, we didn't have any pay because we started off with six University of Ottawa professors uh, who didn't, we'd all got day jobs, we didn't actually need to be paid and so we were quite happy not to be paid. The sheer pleasure of teaching where you're allowed to pray at the beginning of a lecture is quite overwhelming the first time you do it. Uh, Robert, Robbie George has found a way of doing it even in Princeton now. When he teaches uh, American constitutional law, he uh, reads the preamble, uh, and then he says to the law students, uh, I think it would be very appropriate if you all bowed your head and thanked whoever or whatever you thank for these goods. <laughs> so the atheist had to think, well, why do I think it happened? And of course the TAs are running around muttering church and state, and <laughs> Robbie George times them for a full five minutes, 
meditation before he begins his course on constitutional law. You can get away with these things now. Uh, the world is, uh, their world is falling apart, and they know it. Uh, and that's another reason why this project matters. It, it will give a base for building the world which I think God is going to build, because I can't see how the Faculty of Education can get back from where it is now, or the, faculty, the arts faculty as a whole. I mean, when you have professors who don't believe in truth with a capital T and still take a salary, you've got two problems. One, why would you want something that you can't know is true? And two, why would you trust somebody who would teach you things that they don't believe are true or teach you things that they know to be incoherent? Well, that's what they're doing at the moment. It's not surprising. Uh, the young people are deeply disturbed and you get these social justice warriors and everybody else screaming at you in various situations. Uh, it doesn't happen to, uh, to me. Uh, and talking to Jordan Peterson, who they tried to, to uh, kowtow, and he fought back, and now he says, yeah, I've had a few places where the social justice warriors tried to close me down. But of course, once they saw that 400, 500,000 people were going to his lectures online, they couldn't make the case that this should be closed down anymore, could they? And claim to be democratic. Uh, they're in a totally incoherent situation. Uh, I, I think we, we have the solution in our hands that's it's been given to us by God. It began because we watched young people come from Bible schools. That was the worst thing you could do to your children, actually, was send them to Bible school. Not because it's bad to read the Bible. Not that it's bad to go to Cape and Ray and places like that. It isn't. But if they come to university and then quote scripture expecting people to believe that it's authoritative, uh, they're, they're basically making themselves a target. And my malicious colleagues are, are very clever. And they enjoy taking them down. If I said some of the things about evolution that they say about Christianity, I'd be drummed out of the university. But they get away with it. It's malicious. It's wicked. And they will be punished for it. it very much the, the warning that it would be better for them to have a millstone around their neck than to do what they're doing at the moment. I mean, to dis destroy the concept of truth as a valid category. That's a horrendous thing to do. And yet that's what they're doing. And it's so easy to take it apart. I mean, it is an incoherent idea. Because at the moment they say there's no such thing as truth, all you have to say, including what you've just said, of course. <laughs> there is no conversation. Let's shut up shop and go home and you can turn your salary in. They're not going to do that. But we're, very few people so far are capable of taking them on, but we're training them. And they're learning from people like John Peterson, John Lennox, and, Mark Stein, there's so many people now on, on, on YouTube uh, that are doing a wonderful job and they're closing down the people who were doing it before. The, the Muslim radicals are backing off very fast. They're not getting the numbers they were. So the Christian mind is being regenerated and that's good news. But it's been asleep for a long while so it's not been quick. And you notice that even in the Bible there is a progressive development of virtue not an instantaneous one. A uh, lovely example of it that I came across from Jonathan Sachs, the chief rabbi in London, who gave a lovely talk not long ago on Genesis. Four dysfunctional families. I mean, that's the, that's the start of the story, and it's going to go on that way until, until the Lord returns, isn't it? So it's not as though we're dealing with anything new. But he said there was a little progress, wasn't there? I mean, the first one was really awful. Cain killed Abel. Not a great start to brotherly love, was it, really? Uh, the next one, marginally better, but not much. I mean, Isaac and uh, uh, Ishmael managed to get to Abraham's burial, but that was about it. Uh, that's as far as brotherly relationship went. When you get to Jacob and Esau, they had a bad time too, but when they met, they did it actually fall on one another's shoulders and weep. There was some sense that there was an emotional attachment and then you get to Joseph, who, who said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good, and he forgave them. That's a growth in brotherly love over however long it took to get from uh, Adam to uh, Joseph. But it's not quick. 
Uh, and we need to understand that. And one of the good things about what happens at the college is, of course, the vast majority of students come, and they come because they've got support from home. They are key players in the future. In Africa, the big problem is you need three or four generations to get Christian virtues. Mm. It's not a product of conversion immediately at all. Historically, if you look at the places where the gospel went to a pagan society, it's up to four centuries before you see any real development, say, of the rights of women or the government or justice. It's not quick. You have tribal ways of doing things hanging around for a long while. I mean, in Britain even, when the gospel got to Britain in the first century after Christ with uh, the other Augustine, and uh, it took, the Celts understood it, but then they got pushed right out to the Celtic Rim, and the, the wild Norsemen and the Vikings took over, and it was bloody mayhem, uh, worse than Rwanda. And it went on for, for a long while. And then Gregory the Great heard how bad it was in England, and he sent the missionaries. And uh, they got to the English Channel and heard just how bad it was on the other side, and they went back to Rome. Uh, and Gregory was uh, one of the really good popes. He said, you've been sent, and he prayed with them and sent them back again. Uh, and they got to the, the Channel, and he'd given them very wise advice. He said, uh, don't preach, just live. Let them see how you love one another for at least a year and then start preaching. Um, they survived that year and their living was impressive. So that when they did uh, start preaching, the gospel went from the channel to the Scottish border in no time flat. But it was 400 years before we had a king who could read and write and cared about the gospel. And that was Alfred, probably the best king we ever had who translated some of the scriptures into the vernacular and started common law. But 400 years is a long while to wait, isn't it? But not in God's uh, terminology. I, I'm very fond of Abraham, you know. I, I really appreciate his honesty about his own way of being when uh, God says to him, look, it's all yours. Uh, oh, and by the way, your children will be slaves in Egypt for 400 years. And Abraham says, thank you. <laughs> because he's going to die of a ripe old age. Uh, grandfatherly love didn't stretch very far in those days, did it? But God is not in a hurry. It was part of the deal, because the iniquity of the Amorites has not yet fallen. So I don't know how long it's going to take for what we're doing to grow, but I can... I think I'm not stretching my faith to think that it can. So we started uh, 20 years ago after a five-year reading program which taught us what we needed to know, and that is that you are a historical, and your children are too. What happened, now let's make the question a little harder, of whom was it said that he knew, no jo knew not Joseph, and what was the consequence? And we'll leave Don out this time, you answer the question. <laughs> Pharaoh. Pharaoh, and what was the consequence? The consequence was uh, the burden that was placed on the Israelites for building and making bricks yep. and all that. And they became slaves. They became slaves, yeah. So when our rulers no longer know the Lord, no longer know his law, no longer acknowledge it, we will become slaves. It's already happening, isn't it, in a way? Mm -hmm. We have lost a considerable amount of freedom of speech. Those that speak out are silenced in various ways. And you have to be quite subtle to win those battles. Uh, common law was much better than codified law. We have more quite codified law. The Charter of Rights in Canada is a disaster. Common law is much safer. But So we're going to need small communities where things can happen. And, when we get second and third and fourth generation Christians, that's a different world. Those are the people that can be trusted because you do inherit that, don't you? Uh, your parents do lean over your shoulder, so to speak. Uh, we don't do that in our family. You all know that, don't you? There are things you couldn't do because, well, your family doesn't do that. And the things you have to do because that's the way your family are. And you can see it. Generation by generation, if you obey the covenantal relationship and what's involved, if you will keep these laws, it will go well with you and your children forever. 
that's the promise. The law is not meant to be taken as a, something that's passed away when Christ came. It has to be fulfilled before it passes away. So the, the ritual law that pointed to the sacrificial lamb and to the sacrifice of Christ, of course, that is fulfilled. But we're still killing, coveting, murdering and all the rest. Uh, uh, those laws are still in place. And what Christ did was to turn them on their head and make them much more, much, give them an entirely different function. The Jews to this day think that the law is the way to bring the Messiah to earth. If, they say if, if Jews kept the law for one day, Messiah would come. But what Jesus said is you misunderstood the law. The law is not to make you good. The law is to teach you that you need a saviour. Paul gets it in one sentence, one of my favourite sentences in the New Testament. The law is a schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. That's, and we haven't had the schoolmasters around. What we're attempting to do is to get back to those older foundations. It, we called it Augustine College because of Augustine's motto, which is credo et intelligam, which being interpreted for Americans is, I believe in order to understand. The university thinks the exact opposite. The university thinks you understand in order to believe. But Augustine was right, and the university is wrong. What you believe determines what you can understand. So great leaps forward have to be based on a foundation that you realize must be true, and then you start testing it. Uh, we're straightforward that the basis of what we do is the whole story of the Bible. Uh, Anselm's formulation of that was faith-seeking understanding. It's the same idea. We start from what God did for us, and then we use our minds uh, to build up on that basis. And God's work done in God's way will never lack God's provision. Who said that? Hmm? So, sorry? George Mueller. Yeah, and Hudson Taylor used it too, and of course they were very closely connected. Uh, I was brought up on that generation of missionaries and those faith-based missionaries, and uh, I'm glad I was. So it's actually been good for us to realize that we can't go out looking for people. When we need someone, we have to pray. Edward Tingley, who's currently probably the most important teacher at the college, certainly does more teaching than anyone else, got to us by a case of mistaken identity. <laughs> Uh, he read something I'd written and he sent me an email saying he appreciated it. I mistook him for a lawyer that I knew in Montreal. And I sent a note back saying, thank you for your kind words. We haven't met for a few years. I'm going to be at McGill giving some lectures in a few weeks' time. Perhaps we could have coffee. And uh, he sent an email back. He said, I think you've mistaken me for someone else, but I would love to have coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and he came to every lecture. And then it so happened he'd earned his living for 10, 15 years writing the brochures for art exhibitions because of his knowledge of art, although he had a PhD in philosophy, only an undergraduate degree in art history. But the contracts had suddenly dried up a few months before and he was approaching going on welfare, which really hurt him. And when he heard about the, the college, he said, oh, I would love to teach there. Do you have any need for me? And I said, at the moment, we've got the teachers we need, uh, and I don't have any money. Our administrator has had to leave, so there is a small amount of money uh, to, to keep the office in order. He said, I'll do it. And he moved his family to Ottawa for a pittance. Uh, and Graham Hunt, who taught philosophy for a long while, had provided us with a young man. He said, I, I believe he, he will fit the bill, but... It was very apparent within one semester that he didn't really believe the Apostles' Creed in the way that we believed it. Uh, fortunately, talking to him, he, he said first, I don't think I fit here, do I? And I said, I'm glad you came to that conclusion, but I think you're right. And he resigned. And I said to Edward Tingley, well, you've always wanted to teach philosophy. You start on January 1st, or 2nd, actually. Uh, he, had a he has a, a stack this high of polite refusals to academic jobs in philosophy because he got his degree in philosophy when you couldn't get a job in philosophy if you weren't wearing a skirt. 
he was displaced. The, the ad would say teaching experience uh, is uh, preferred and publications are preferred and people who had not, not even completed their PhD got the job ahead of him. Uh, that's disgraceful, is what happened. But he wouldn't have survived in university because undergraduates don't get lectures like his and he couldn't do it in the current university where assistant professors can end up being asked to give six lectures, six courses. I mean, that's insane. But that's what's happened. And, of course, they get all sorts of people to fill in for them. So in an American research university, your children will not have a lecture from uh, a senior professor in the first few years. I, I didn't teach till fourth year. I didn't have to. Why would I? In my cynical days. Uh, I should have done. Uh, I taught one lecture as a sort of penance. I didn't do any more than first year. But that's the world we're in at the moment. But Edward Tingley, uh, every word that he says to the students is thought about. Every word. Uh, he, the, the care that he puts into it is Ed Blader, who's the other long-time academic in the place with me, who's been in the trenches for years. Says he thinks he's teaching a graduate's seminar, um, but he's teaching first-year students. But they appreciate it deeply. Uh, he works very hard with them. God provides for projects that he's doing. And when we were talking in the spring here, I was amazed at the people who turned up in Blacksburg and didn't really seem to know why, except that I could see what they were designed for, so to speak. So um, I, I would be very surprised indeed if this project doesn't take flight here, and I think it will succeed. Uh, Reno, who's the editor of First Things, uh, uh, he's very interested in what's going on. Uh, I got to know him a little bit. I had dinner with him in the spring in New York, and his comment was very interesting. He said, I think that God has used you to come up with an approach to learning that the liberals can't stop. It's cheap. Uh, it's possible. It's local. You don't want a big campus with all the running costs. You want to keep your costs as low as possible. And obviously churches have an interest, don't they, really? A vested interest in having a program running out of their church, which will mean that their students go from the 20% probability of surviving university with their faith intact to something in the 80 or 90% range. That's... That ought to be all the advertising we need, but it hasn't proved to be that yet, because this is a very countercultural thing you're doing. So the one thing I didn't hear, that is our fault for not saying it, uh, you need someone like my wife, who, when a student uh, sends an inquiry, she will talk to that student once a month. And it usually takes three or four steps before they say, I'm going to do it but they appreciate the fact that she will talk to them. Uh, it's very countercultural. They're leaving their peer group, and the current generation are very peer group dependent in many ways. Uh, and by Christmas, it's going to be worse. I have to tell them when they go back, because, of course, in the state university, the mainline universities, nothing goes into the head in the first semester, really, in most places. I usually rather cynically say that they will lose their mind, their faith, and their virginity in random order in the first semester in most universities. Just read about the Yale Sex Week if you, don't, if you think I'm exaggerating. I'm not, sadly. Whereas we start work on day one. There are no Frosh Week activities. Uh, and I tell them when they go home at Christmas, don't expect your peer group to be there talking about what they've learned, because they haven't learned anything. Even more interesting is how long it actually takes for takeoff to occur. It doesn't happen until halfway through the second semester. They're interested, but the stuff is coming from all directions. And they've never had an integrated course in their lives before, so this is a new experience. Uh, but I know what's going to happen after 20 years of watching it. They're on an exponential curve. I don't even give a mark in my course until the last essay which is a long essay, eight pages or so, uh, because it's going to be so much better than anything they've ever written in their life before. 
And I can send that essay to uh, an academic where they want to go. I say, don't apply to university at this point because uh, they have deadlines, but they'll break those rules for a good student because everybody wants the best students. And they're changing their, their rules for homeschool kids because they know they're, by and large, they're better than the others. So find out what you want to do and where you want to go, and then we'll use our network to find someone on the other side of the bureaucratic barrier. And all you have to do is send your best essay with the following question. Have you had a first-year student who could write an essay like this? The answer is no. In fact, one of our students didn't do that. He, he, he had a job, but he, he went to do a course at another university, just a night school course. He didn't bother about credits, really. But the first assignment was handed in, and the professor taking the course gave out the papers, except his. And he said, come and see me. And he, he thought, what have I done wrong? When he got to the professor's office, he said, where did you learn to write like this? You're wasting your time taking this course. We better move your point. So he moved him up to a course that was he was ready for. That's that's what it's like because they don't write anything nowadays. I mean, you can go through engineering school and medical school without writing any sentences. That's not education. This sentence wrote itself. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You, you remember, you'll use that one, won't you? So, uh, I'm told I have to stop, but if there are any questions, you, you can have a go at me. I could go on for a long while about the things that happened. But when you have no resources, except the cattle on a thousand hills, it, it's quite interesting. How many students did you have to start out? The first year was a double year, so it was, it was, we got to 20 that year. Uh, because by the time they'd bullied us into doing it, it was sort of September. So a lot of people put off starting university. So we had a double year. So the average has been around 12. And it, it crept up and then it sort of hivers and hovers around that figure. But you have a, a much greater support from the local churches here than we've ever had in Ottawa. Ottawa is a very liberal city. Like all government cities, like Washington. And, People don't invest in one another because you know you spend time getting to know someone. If they're in politics, they disappear. You know, the the mean stay in Ottawa is about three years. Very hard to build this sort of thing in that context. Yeah, I mean, you have something like the same thing, but on a much smaller scale with the university. But government, that's difficult, and they also necessarily are quite cynical. So it's a difficult place to do it. So if it succeeded there, I can't see why it wouldn't succeed much more easily here, where you have a stable community, you have people who must have watched what's happening to the young people when they go to university. I mean, how many of you have seen a disaster in your family when someone went off to university? Yeah, and I'm surprised it's only two, uh, three, yeah. Uh, that's going to be an increasing phenomenon, especially, uh, it's fine if you do engineering or medicine or, or law, uh, you know, technical, professional things, although the law is a disaster. Uh, the Christian Legal Fellowship organizations are one-tenth of the size of the Christian Medical Associations, although there are far more lawyers than doctors in your country and ours. That's telling you a lot about what goes on in that very cynical environment. And doctors, we, we're only running at, you know, well, we have about 30,000 doctors and we have uh, just under 2,000 members of CM, CMF, CMDS. Uh, we've got a long way to go, and we, we need to work harder on it. But for most people, you see, they don't see anything in an evangelical fellowship organization. Uh, what they do appreciate is having people who can represent their views to the government on things like euthanasia and abortion and doctor's rights and more. So uh, we need to be more involved in that kind of area. Yes. What would you say um, to a student who might not have uh, the approval of their parents to do something like this? Well, uh, I mean, it's very difficult. You, you couldn't get into Canada without the approval of your parents until you were 18 or 19, although you could have an abortion at 12. I mean, it's, that's the world we live in, uh, without the approval of parents. Uh, 
there would be some parents who wouldn't, I guess, but we've never faced that problem. Uh, but you would have to obey, I think, until you were old enough to say no. <clears throat> Yes. So, uh, actually, there was a question earlier that got deferred till. You. Yep. Chris, I think you were asking about something. Yeah, you mentioned. I just mentioned. Uh, was there any connection with ministers like Cape and Ray that have yeah, yeah. a gap year philosophy as well? Yes, um, I do suggest to people that they look upon it as a gap year to begin. But if they do well, they'll get scholarships and things in a very high proportion of cases. Uh, Wheaton will take our students for one year's credit straight away. So 8,000 for your first year at Wheaton is not a bad idea. Um, and you need to get to know Wheaton as soon as you're up and running. And they will, they know what comes out of this program. Uh, Baylor is being the, the, the liberal end of the spectrum is now David has retired. It's not being as kind to us as it was. But Chicago, for instance, gave us uh, uh, gave one of our students all the li liberal arts credits she needed for pre-med for her year with us. They interviewed her and they, they wouldn't believe what she said. And they said, that, it can't be that good, but obviously you're worthy of credits. Come, we'll see what you're like, and we'll give you credits. And they gave her all the credits she needed so that she could do Russian. Uh, she was Ross Betts' daughter, actually. Um, so good universities will look at our students seriously if we go through the back door to an academic. Now, Cape and Ray, the Bible schools and the like, are doing an entirely different thing, and they're not a preparation for university. The modern world, those six issues that I've talked about this weekend are not dealt with at Cape and Ray and the Bible schools. I'm trying to get them to do it. Uh, churches should do it too, but I've yet to meet a youth pastor who could do those questions. And that needs to change. I mean, the youth work has got to be more than adult childcare. Yes? What will Virginia Tech say in 10 years? What will? What will Virginia Tech say when Augustine College is in their town? That's a good question. Uh, they probably won't notice. <laughs> because it isn't that many. Uh, good academics will like it. The bureaucrats will not cooperate, of course. But you don't need their cooperation. Uh, we haven't had outright antagonism except from some of the arts faculties who know what we stand for. Virginia Tech is much more of a tech... It is a technical university in many respects. And most universities are heading in that direction. The real university that answered the big questions, you know, where, where, am I, where am I from, why am I here, where am I going, those questions, they're not being asked at all in the university now. So it's not surprising that our students are committing suicide and that they feel that life has no meaning because the big story has not been told. So by having an integrated program that starts at 3000 BC and comes up to the present, what they see is the unfolding of a story. You don't have, you don't have to rub it in. All you have to do is say what these people did and what their motivations were. Um, the rest follows. Have any of you read any Rodney Stark yet? No. Well, you have, yeah. I think it would be well worthwhile. I was saying to Ty that the, the, the book for the glory of God, the chapter on God's handiwork is... A very, very good chapter. He, he basically does what the standard textbook in the history of science by David Lindbergh takes a book to do. He does in a chapter. He was a journalist before he became a professor, so he writes very well. So those of you who are interested in, in how to think about science in, in the modern world and be able to get back at the culture, that's the best introduction I know, that chapter, God's Handiwork in For the Glory of God by Rodney Stark. I'd like to see that chapter as a booklet. Um, maybe somebody could talk to Rodney Stark about whether he would allow that. Because people, they hear science has shown, almost invariably when you hear science has shown, you know it hasn't. <laughs> yes? Uh, what would you 
say to students that are um, maybe more geared towards the math or physics or sciences, um, but like for myself, for example, I'm, I'm studying mechanical engineering, but have an appreciation for these things, but yeah. I wouldn't write for the sake of writing because I don't enjoy it as much. No, no. Um, what do we do about engineers is what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, well, we need to civilize them. <laughs> for the sake of their spouses, it should go. Um, they enjoy it, but most of them don't come to us, of course. I've got my two oldest grandsons are, no, sorry, not the two oldest, one of the oldest. I've got four grandsons, none of which have come to college yet. One of them will come later, two of them will come later. But they're, they're all straight arrows, you know. They, uh, men are much more tunnel vision than women, but we've been 50-50, basically. Uh, but almost invariably not, uh, except doctors. We've had a lot, because a lot of doctors realized that medicine requires this much more than it used to. Uh, in engineering, the area where you might find will start attracting you, you're being taught ethics, professional ethics, right? Yeah. All, all engineering schools, like all medical schools. You know that the first cheating in Canada was engineers in an ethics lecture? They packed into the ethics lectures computer and were stupid <laughs> enough to basically give the words in the order he'd given them, you know, even a... An Essex prof could recognize that something had happened here. <laughs> They're a bit dumb at that level. But uh, because, I mean, China can build as good aircraft and buildings as we can, but they crash more often. Because the Essex are not there. The key in China is to use second-rate materials, but not so second-rate that it will collapse before you die. <laughs> and sometimes you get it wrong. Recycled parts are not a good idea for jet, jet engines, are they? <laughs> but they do it in China. So, you are going to find in engineering too that some people are going to be looking for trust. And they're going to realize that trust is not something you get with a degree from a university. Uh, I used to, when I was young, uh, Christians would start their medical practices with non-Christians because they wanted to evangelize. I told them, don't do that anymore. You need to work with people who share your faith because times are harder than they used to be. That's going to happen in engineering too and everywhere else. Uh, so the, there's reason to come and know the history and understand how we got into this mess. One of the talks that, that I get asked to do quite frequently is how we got to here, uh, the, the, the history of the decline of ethics. And that apl applies across the board. Companies don't last anywhere near as long as they used to, do they? And the unscrupulous methods of businessmen and thieves uh, is amazing. What's really amusing, have you noticed that, uh, you probably don't know this, that on many doctors' places, offices and things, you see the caduceus with the wings on, right? Serpent and the wings. Mm -hmm. That's not the right caduceus. That's the caduceus of, Bis of Mercury, who's the businessman and thieves god. <laughs> Hippocrates doesn't have any wings. Mm -hmm. And there's long discussion about where the snake came from. Did he know anything about Moses? We think not but it looks very like it, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. But maybe Microsoft got it right, and many businessmen, they are dedicated to Mercury, not to Hippocrates. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be a small thing who you can trust. And you do form your first layer of trust when you come to Augusta. They keep in touch. As Jenny said, I don't know if you noticed that on the... On the uh, Skype, that she said, oh yeah, we're in touch every day. That's, that, I, I couldn't believe that when I discovered that that's, what, that's one of the good things about uh, the modern media, is that they can keep in touch and know where they are faith-wise. Jenny and the girl she mentioned, Lisa, and another doctor, Stardriga from Saskatchewan, uh, they fly once a year to somewhere where they can all meet. Uh, it's astonishing, the hunger for a, a network of people you can trust. Yes? 
Yeah, I just wanted to add for Nathan's sake that um, in Blacksburg, we may well have an engineering focus larger than the one in Ottawa, because God has brought so many great Christian engineering professors yes. here. Yep. We're formulating that right now. Yeah, make it a, a possibly a, a different stream because the arts types that they freak out at the at a, an equation is a way to destroy them on the spot. You know, so, uh, I've tried it a few times. I've given up. You know, it's not worth the effort. Uh, all you get is pure panic. <laughs> I think we have time for maybe one or one question again. I I think uh, yeah. people may want to hear and talk later on, but I want to be sensitive, too, to all the volunteers we've had to set things up and yep. people who would like to go and, and to go. take you down. It is Sunday tomorrow, yes. It is Sunday, and we have the service early tomorrow at yep. 9.15, but this will officially close our conference, and I just wanted to thank everyone, and if people still want to ask questions, please gather around as we're clearing things out. Um, Continue the conversation. Is there something else you want to say? No, no, no. Okay. I'm, 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 All right, well, thank you, Dr.